Uh, yes, I am Katie and I am a former Gold Coast girl, so I'm delighted to have an excuse to be back here, especially on the company dime, that's very nice. Uh, I left the coast in May last year when I landed my dream job writing Haskell at Facebook London. And one thing I've learnt uh, living in the UK and, and working with people from around the world is that I do not in fact speak English, I speak Australian. Those of you who've lived overseas have probably experienced this. Uh, I knew going over there that uh, people were probably going to give me strange looks if I use words like thongs and pants because they have vastly different meanings. And I pretty quickly discovered that I could bamboozle people with all the Aussie abbreviations, things like Vickies and Arvo and Fireys. Um, but what uh, surprised me a lot more is just how many terms that, to me, are just regular speech, like I use them every day, could completely confuse my colleagues. So, uh, for example, one day I was at lunch and, and someone asked me, oh, how's the dessert? And I said, oh yeah, I rate it. And they just stared at me waiting for the rest of the sentence. <laughs> you rated it, what, five out of 10, six out of 10? Uh, I told one of my colleagues that I was paying someone out for using Emacs. And they're like, you paid someone to use Emacs? <laughs> Completely did not translate. Uh, probably the worst misunderstanding I've had so far though was uh, when I told Brit I'd been having a bit of a bad day and I cracked the proverbial. Let me tell you, when you say this in England, people do not think anger, they think bowel movement. <laughs> and it is a, a tad embarrassing. Uh, so, yes, these are lessons you learn as a foreigner and there can be uh, awkward moments and blank stares that you get from people. But actually, uh, I find uh, talking with people about these things and breaking down the differences uh, between our languages actually a whole lot of fun. I really enjoy it. And that's uh, pretty much what I want to achieve here today also. You might be wondering why I'm at RubyConf talking about Haskell. Uh, as a Haskeller, I am a foreigner here. Basically, what I'm hoping to do is give you a little bit of insight into the Haskeller point of view, uh, because I firmly believe that uh, exposure to other languages, ex understanding other languages, broadens our horizons and gives us uh, lots of new ideas. So I'm hoping to do a little bit of that today um, and, and hopefully give you the impression that Haskell is something that's worth learning about, because I think it's a language with a lot of interesting ideas. It's a very different language from Ruby uh, in lots of ways. There are two things that I want to focus on, two major differences, and that's that Haskell is a purely functional language. And secondly, uh, the, what was referenced in the title of my talk, that it's a language with strong static types. The functional programming approach combined with a really rich type system uh, gives rise to all kinds of really useful abstractions and safety guarantees. And those wins were among the major reasons why Haskell was chosen for the project that I work on at Facebook, which is called Haskell. So I'd like to share some of the story of how we came to be using Haskell for this uh, at Facebook and uh, yeah, explain along the way uh, why I think this language is a great match for our use case. So that use case is fighting spam at scale, as has been mentioned, uh, as well as things like malicious URLs, um, uh, malware, other nasty things that people want to put on the site. And to handle that, the process goes something like this. You have a user that comes along and they take some action. Maybe they're writing a status update or sending a message. Uh, that's going to have to end up in the database somewhere on the back end. Before we actually do that, though, we want to do a check. Is this activity actually legitimate? Should we let it go ahead? Uh, and if the answer is no, we might want to take some other action. Perhaps we say, sorry, no, you can't post that link, or maybe we present a capture, or whatever the case may be. And the system that we use uh, to do these checks is a rules engine called Sigma. So Sigma is a, a Haskell and C++ uh, hybrid, and it runs rules that are written in Haskell in an embedded domain-specific language, and that's what Haxel is. This system handles more than a million requests a second, so it needs to be really fast, uh, efficient, and also robust. Uh, there's tens of billions of user actions that are classified uh, every day by the system across Messenger, Facebook, and Instagram. So the logic that's expressed in one of these rules, it might look something like this, and I've written it in, in Ruby here for familiarity, but I'll show you a Haskell version later. So let's say we're trying to see if someone is spamming friends about Haskell. Um, so they, they write some post on a friend's uh, wall. So we're going to check, is that post actually about Haskell? Uh, do these people not have all that many friends in common? And do most of the friends' friends actually like Ruby? In that, if that is the case, we're going to say, that's spammy. These Rubyists don't want to hear about Haskell. We'll block the post. 
Otherwise, we do nothing. So this is the kind of thing we can express. And this is a manually written rule. Uh, we also have machine learning stuff as well, but that's uh, beyond the scope of what I'm talking about today. So uh, at Facebook, we need to be able to respond quickly to spam attacks. You never know when these things are going to occur. And for that reason, these rules are continuously deployed. So the code that's running in Sigma in production is the same code that's in the source control repository. And these days, that code is written in Haxel, in the DSL, as I've mentioned. Uh, but prior to that, uh, the journey to Haskell started with another language called FXL. FXL stands for Feature Extraction Language. You've probably never heard of this before because this was an in-house language developed at Facebook and it's an interpreted language. And I say was because we killed FXL completely and migrated everything over to Haxel. FXL was uh, developed specifically for this Sigma use case, for spam fighting, and the decision was made to make it a functional language. That is, a language where functions don't have any side effects. They don't do anything observable other than simply returning a result based on their inputs. And I'm not going to go any deeper into that concept today because Bianca's talking tomorrow all about functional programming. Uh, but this property is really important for the Sigma use case because it facilitates one of the, the key things that this DSL needs to achieve, and that's efficient data fetching. So when a request comes into Sigma uh, to check one of those particular right actions, it's usually going to need to consult a bunch of other data sources in, in order to compute that result. So for a Haskell spammer example, it's going to need to go find out how many friends you actually have and whether uh, all those friends actually do indeed like Ruby or not. Um, so the user is waiting while this happens. They've, they've written their status update, they've pressed enter. So latency is really, really important here. So we want that data fetching to be as efficient as possible. So in order to make it fast and efficient, uh, rather than processing these requests Sequentially, it makes sense, of course, to do them concurrently and also to batch up uh, requests to the same data source. And that's exactly what FXL was optimised for. So requests in this rules code, uh, they were automatically batched and run concurrently without the programmer actually having to write anything specifically about how that concurrency occurs. And these and other optimizations in FXL were possible because of the functional style used. So to make that a little bit more concrete, uh, here's an example of that rule again. Uh, this time in FXL and also one of the functions it references, num common friends. So there's a few things to notice here. Um, because we know that none of these function calls does anything else other than return a result based on its inputs, they're pure, there's no uh, writes to databases or logging going on, that means we can uh, execute all of this lazily. So for example, we've got that three checks here talking about Haskell num common friends. If that first check returns false, um, then we can safely not run the, the second two things there, num, common friends, or most friends like Ruby. And we know we can do that because they're not doing anything other than returning a result. They're not manipulating any external state. And this is true not just for things uh, in, in and clauses, but true for anything, any uh, statements that we have. It also means that we can safely memoize things. So if the call to uh, num common friends with those two particular IDs is repeated twice in the rules code, we can uh, save the result the first time, and the second time we see that, safely just return that same thing, because we know uh, that it doesn't actually have to do that data fetch twice. So this is another optimization to make things more efficient. Uh, and that does assume that we have a, a consistent state of the world during the computation of a particular rule, and that, that's an assumption that the system does make. Uh, another important thing means that we can safely reorder things. So in the bottom function there, we've got two calls to friends of. Um, it doesn't matter which one of these we do first. Either way, it's not going to make a difference because these are pure functions. And in fact, we can also do them at the same time. And that's the key insight. That's uh, where we introduce concurrency, and that's what FXL does. So it would automatically run code like this and make those calls concurrently without the, the programmer having to explicitly specify that. So that's FXL. Did this approach work? Yes, it did. Uh, so the estimate was that it gave a 20 times speed up uh, when compared to a naive, a naive, naive execution that does eager data fetching. So this worked, um, but FXL was an interpreted language, as I mentioned, and it turned out to be much slower than what we wanted. Uh, its CPU and memory usage were often excessive, uh, and although it was statically typed, it didn't have strong enough correctness guarantees for what we really wanted. And what especially hurt is that it lacked abstraction facilities, things like modules and the, the ability for users to define their own data types. So what did we do? We turned to Haskell. And I realize Haskell might seem like a surprising choice uh, to some of you because there are a lot of myths about this language. I regularly meet people who are quite shocked that Facebook has Haskell in production because they think that Haskell is an academic language. 
something for researchers rather than for the real world. And Haskell is academic in the sense that it came from academia and it still has a strong tradition there. Researchers are still using Haskell. Um, and it actually was a programming language designed by a committee. Yet, uh, contrary to what XKCD might have you believe, <laughs> it is also very much a practical general purpose language and it is being used in industry at big companies like Facebook and many others and also uh, at smaller companies. There's a lot of startups that use the language. So why? Why are people using Haskell? Um, I think it's that purity that I've been talking about combined with the rich type system. The benefit of that is that it enables you to reason about your code. Uh, and that means to draw conclusions about the code just based on what's in front of you, without having to kind of dive into other parts of the code base for context. Just based on what, what is in front of you, you can make all kinds of inferences. And that has lots of nice flow on effects uh, for things like testing. You can do things like property-based testing. Have you ever heard of quick check? There's also a Ruby check, I understand. Uh, also things like refactoring. And importantly for the Haxel project, concurrency. So here's uh, the Haskell spammer example again, this time in Haxel and Haskell. Um, not going to try and talk through all the syntax because there's a bit too much so that that's different. Um, but we've still got our three checks there. Are they talking about Haskell, Numco and Friends? And it's still going to be short cutting. So uh, if the first check fails, we're not going to bother computing those other things. Um, the other thing to notice here is in this most friends like Ruby function, uh, so what's happening is here, we're getting some friends and then we're filtering over those friends and doing a check for each one, does that person like Ruby? Uh, that's going to automatically happen concurrently in Haxel. So this is not something from Haskell, it's actually something in Haxel that we've implemented on top. With, and you can see there's nothing else going on there, there's no explicit forking or any kind of c concurrency construct. Um, but this is uh, something that we've added on top and that's possible because Haskell, again, because we have these, uh, we can reason about these things because of a functional purity. So that's really nice. And on top of all of that, we also got the win of a type system that offers the abstraction facilities that we're lacking in FXL. So you can make your own data types in Haskell and then you can use the type system to prevent whole classes of bugs. So the aim is to use types in such a way that the Haskell type checker will yell at you if you've done something wrong. That's why what I'm alluding to with the strong not so silent type. This is a good thing. You want the compiler to yell at you. Uh, when there's something there to, to yell about. Um, and that's especially important with the continuous deployment that I've mentioned. So people are, are committing rules to this repository and a few minutes later they're in production. So of course we want some guarantees about that. When we know that uh, those rules are not going to be able to crash Sigma, they're not going to be able to interfere with each other, so the rules and different policies don't interact, we get those guarantees because of the type system. So that's a big win for us. So to just give you some insight into some of the things that types can help prevent, I had a, a function in there called has a soak. So this is just checking you've got two IDs of things in a graph and the ID of an association that might be between them. Uh, and so you might have it defined something like this. And this is the kind of type it might have in FXL. So just so you can read that. So this is saying it's a function called has a soak. It takes three int and it returns a bool. What ends up happening when you have a function like this? Well, invariably, one day people flip the int. They end up putting the soak ID as the first one rather than ID. And then in production, something goes wrong. How do you fix it? Well, in Haskell, we can do something like this. Oop, too far. Ah. There we go. Uh, so we have a thing called new type. This is just wrapping up another existing type and giving it a name. So we're just tagging new type. So we can create something that's an ID and create something that's an Ahsoka ID. And these are now completely separate things to the compiler. Both still ints can still do pretty much the same thing. But what it means is now we can define a function like this. And now if someone accidentally puts an Osoko D first, the compiler will yell at them. That code won't even compile, which is a big win. Uh, another little example. So this is a way you can define um, a data type in Haskell, a very simple algebraic data type, we call them. This is a sum type. It's kind of like an enum. So we're, we're defining a type called language and it has three ways of constructing it. It can be Ruby, Haskell, or PHP. And this is nice because it means we can then have a function that takes one of those languages rather than a string or some other thing. And we can pattern match on that. So we can write different implementations for these different languages. So in this case, uh, this implementation is for Ruby. And in that case, we're just checking if there's a like association maybe to the Ruby page or the Rails page. We can do something similar for Haskell. And then maybe for PHP, we don't even bother checking. We just say, oh, no one likes PHP. <laughs> um, but what is especially nice about this is that when we come along later and say, hey, we want to add Elixir to this list. 
the compiler will yell at us if we don't also come along and add an implementation of Elixir for this function. So it's just another simple example of where we can use our type checking to prevent bugs and we find them then at compile time rather than at runtime. And this is just kind of the tip of the iceberg of where types can take you. Uh, there's yeah, lots and lots and lots you can do with them to get those correctness guarantees. So you might be thinking this is all very well and good, but I've heard this Haskell language is really hard to learn. How did you get people at Facebook to use it? So is Haskell difficult? Um, the way that I like to frame it is that Haskell is really different. Uh, so a lot of people come to Haskell and they've learned other languages, normally imperative languages, and they think, oh yeah, it won't take that long to learn. I'll just kind of map the concepts from what we've learned in Ruby or Python to Haskell. And it just doesn't work so well. Haskell is vastly different. It's based on a very different uh, way of doing things, based on lambda calculus. So uh, I think, yeah, it, it really helps if you adjust expectations accordingly that this will take a bit of time to learn. And the other thing about it is that while functional programming concepts are actually quite simple, in Haskell there ends up being a lot of abstraction. And abstraction just by its nature takes a long time to learn. Like you've got to see lots of concrete examples of a thing before you can kind of see, oh yeah, I can abstract over all of those. Um, so both of those things mean it, it can take a bit of time to learn this language, but I think it's very much worth persisting with. So what did we do at Facebook? Uh, so we had a few different things. We had uh, a bunch of teaching materials. We ran a three-day course for people, and we also had a group called Haxel Therapy. This is the logo uh, where people could come in and, and drop their questions. Uh, and so, yeah, this was a process, but uh, part of it was uh, minimising the number of abstractions we taught up front. We didn't drop scary words like monads and whatnot, um, just focused on the core concept. And so dozens of people now are actually using uh, Haskell and Haxel at Facebook, and that includes both developers and non-developers, and they're still happily committing away like they were in FXL. So we've been able to do this successfully. Another myth you might have heard is that Haskell is some cure-all. Choose Haskell for your project and everything will be wonderful. You'll have no problems. Yeah, this is also yeah, very much a myth. Um, choosing Haskell will not solve all your problems. We had uh, a bunch of code in FXL that we had to machine translate to Haskell, and some of that yeah, ended up being really ugly. Um, so we had things like this, and I know you're about to read the code here, but the key is the shape. We call these code tornadoes. And this is a small one. I've seen some in the Haskell code base that are like hundreds of lines long, way more than you could fit on a slide. This is all if then else, if then else, if then else. There are ways of, of fixing these things, but the point is yeah, just, just using Haskell for something does not mean that everything suddenly becomes lovely. Uh, like any other language, uh, you've got to learn how to use it well, you can write bad code. So what were the results? Uh, so we found that Haskell performed as much as three times faster than FXL for some requests, and the throughput uh, improved by 30% when we moved to Haskell. So performance-wise, it was a big win. Dozens of people learned Haskell, and uh, our surveys indicate that they're quite comfortable in doing so now people are now starting to make their own types, which is excellent. So we're having people use all this custom data type stuff to catch bugs at compile time rather than at runtime. So we're fighting the good fight against spam, and Haskell's been a really good choice for that. What does it mean for you? Um, I think the takeaway uh, is just that it's worth pursuing other languages. It's worth uh, learning these ideas. Haskell especially has had an influence on lots of other programming languages. It's actually one of the, the goals of the language was to, to do that. Uh, so if you have the chance, I think taking a look or just learning a functional concepts in whichever language takes your fancy can be really useful. And these things can be applied uh, in other languages. You can choose to write methods in a pure way in Ruby if you, if you want. And I understand there's also been a few experiments with types in Ruby as well. Um, so lots of things to think about there. Uh, as a person that's been part of the Ruby community in Australia for a few years, I also kind of had some thoughts about what, what can go the other way. What could Haskell be learning from Ruby? And the huge lesson, I think, is all around community. Um, you guys do community really, really well. I think especially in recent years, it's, uh, it's become especially evident. There's things like Rails Girls and Rails Bridge. There's two talks about diversity at this conference. Uh, and you do a really good job of uh, welcoming people and creating uh, documentation that gets people into the language easily. I think we could do better at that in the Haskell world. So yeah, we definitely learn from you guys. Um, if you do try to learn Haskell and you, and you do have some problems along the way, please, yeah, I'd love feedback about that, about how we can make it better, because I think there's a lot that the Haskell community could learn in that regard. I'd like to acknowledge all the different people that have worked uh, on Haskell. This is an open source project, so you can find it on GitHub, and there's a paper on exactly the, the nitty-gritty of how all this works. 
Um, so you can check all of that out. Cheers for giving this Haskell a foreigner a, a fair go to yabber about Typed FP. It's been Bonza. Thanks.